Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight's going to be a special, special edition of the Dharma Doors. Um, I decided, and I wanted to do this last week, um, but since I had to miss last week, I spent a little more time and I put together a little presentation for everybody because I wanted to talk tonight about Manju Sri Bodhisattva. Um, it's specifically the, the Bodhisattva that is the star of the sutra that we've been working on. I'll tell you, let me share with you actually kind of where these ideas started coming from for me. So as you know, if you've been coming to Dharma Doors for a while, we for a very long time now, we've been reading this sutra that's about Manjushri. And it's one of the sutras from a collection of sutras called the Maharatna Kutta collection. And we are basically at the end of that sutra. So we've gone through every, you know, kind of pretty much every line of the sutra up to this point. And what I wanted to mention, like, again, I want to share with you sort of where these ideas came from. We've reached a point in the sutra where the Bodhisattva Maitreya, and you might know, of course, that Maitreya is the future coming Buddha, but he's just a Bodhisattva in a sutra like this. And the Bodhisattva Maitreya asks the Buddha, world honored one what should we call this dharma door how should we uphold it <laughs> now i want you to know that this is a pretty common common thing in mahayana buddha sutras where you'll have the entire sutra and then at the end someone will ask the buddha hey by the way what should we call this? <laughs> and invariably, the Buddha gives multiple names for the sutra. So the Buddha answers Maitreya saying, this Dharma door is called the Buddha's free command of miraculous powers, or it's called the fulfillment of vows, or Manju Shri's adorning a Buddha land with merits, or it's called giving joy to bodhisattvas who generate bodhicitta, or it's called the prediction of Manju Shri's attainment of Buddhahood. You should accept and uphold it by these names. <laughs> so, Let's start there. So we're given a few different names for this sutra. And so the first thing that I noticed, the first thing I thought of, and you might have already noticed it too, if you've been coming to the classes, all throughout this, I have been reading either from this translation, which is from the Chinese, or we've been reading a translation that's from the Tibetan. And all along, I've had to I've had to deal with the fact that in Tibetan, this sutra has one name, and in Chinese, it has a different name. <clears throat> in fact, in the Chinese, it's called the prediction of Manjushri's enlightenment or Buddhahood. <clears throat> and the in the Tibetan, it's called the array of virtues of Manjushri's Buddha land. Well, we just basically, or I just read why, why this sutra might have two different names. In fact, it has four or five different names, right? So right there, that kind of gave me an idea for, uh, a, for a class, for, for a Dharma Doors session here. And what it was, was, and I, I did this last time too, or two weeks ago. This is a class that I probably should have given a lot, like at the beginning of this, because I'm about to kind of go through the history of 
who is Manju Shri? Like, where does this person come from? Like, who are they? And yeah, this probably would have been more appropriate earlier on, but I didn't think to, I didn't think to do it then. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you a little, let's see here. Oh, so hope, hopefully everybody can see that. This is going to be a survey of the literature of Manjushri, Bodhisattva of Wisdom. Um, so, Noam, is that clear on the screen? Cool. Okay. So I'll be up here or wherever I am on your screen, uh, but I'm going to walk you through a survey of the literature of Manjushri. I hope you find this interesting. There's going to be a, um, you know, there's going to be quite a bit of Dharma going on here, but not in the usual way. I want to start by mentioning kind of where the bulk, the bulk of the information that I'm about to give you is going to be coming from an article by a scholar, a professor, uh, Paul Harrison. His article is called Manju Shri and the Cult of the Celestial Bodhisattvas. It's from that journal, the Chonghua Buddhist Journal from the year 2000. I'm pretty sure you can find a copy of this online if you want to read the whole thing. It's not a super long article, but it's it's very full of information. So again, I want to give Paul Harrison credit. If you don't know about Paul Harrison, I'll probably mention him a lot this evening. He is one of the best uh, scholars of Buddhism out there today. He teaches up at Stanford. Uh, when I was applying for PhD programs, I applied to study with him there. I didn't make it into that program, but nonetheless, Paul Harrison is an awesome scholar. He's written extensively on sort of the origins of the Bodhisattva path, the origins of Bodhisattva-ness in that way. He has several books, tra has translated many sutras. Uh, and many great articles as well. So again, I just want to give him credit for a lot of these ideas. Let's start with just uh, as usual, if I have, because this is also something I didn't do at the beginning. So Manju Shri, that name, Manju means gentle, and Shri, of course, means glorious or beautiful or wonderful. And so he is this gentle beauty or gentle, glorious one. And the picture that you see here on your screen is a very typical representation of Manjushri, the gentle, glorious one. Invariably, Manjushri carries the sword of wisdom that he wields over his head. It's a Vajra sword. Uh, there's a lot of things that I could say about that. He also carries a sutra. That sutra in his hand is pretty well understood to be the Pranya Paramita Sutra. And that's where Bodhisattva, he is the Bodhisattva of Pranya. He's very associated with that tradition, the Pranya Paramita tradition. But I don't really... I'm not going to actually be talking about the iconography and the art associated with Manjushri because, uh, and actually I'll show you one more image also just to show you again, there's the sword. The sutra is sort of implied in this. It's kind of part, he's making this gesture with his, actually with his left hand, but the sutra is sort of coming out of that lotus flower on his shoulder there. So. The reason why I'm not going to talk about the art and iconography of Manjushri tonight is because my first point, the first thing that I want to make kind of clear, and, and by, again, this is coming from Paul Harrison's article, a bodhisattva like Manjushri has a much older history in literature. Meaning you you don't start to see historically, archaeologically, you don't start to see images of Manjushri for a very long time. I don't know when the earliest known depiction of Manjushri is. Uh, 
But the ones that we have, the statuary, the paintings, certainly anything coming from the Tibetan tradition, all of that is, you know, much later, uh, you know, 6th century, 7th century, 8th century, things like that. However, Manjushri and Manjushri's appearance in the sutras goes way back. And so that's what I want to talk about. As usual, I'm going to use my typical map here. Um, if you haven't seen any of my other visual presentations that I've done for the San Francisco Dharma Collective, uh, I encourage you to go see those. Uh, but I always use this same map. And, you know, this is a really, you know, janky, outdated, dated map. But I like to use a janky, outdated map for a reason. And it's my kind of my first critical point about doing any kind of history or any kind of even geography. Any projection, as they are called, the a map of the world like this is called a projection. Any projection is going to be greatly erroneous. We know this. You know, this is the kind of the standard Merc Mercator projection, which is like, you know, everything's wonky in terms of the sizes of the countries. But again, all projections are wonky. So I use this solely as a reference point, certainly not as kind of indicative of anything. The first thing I do, though, is I remove all the names of these countries. These are all, if I go back real quick, these are, of course, all the modern 20th and 21st century names for these places. That is not useful to us because we're going to be doing some history tonight. So I like to begin just by wiping away all the modern names of these places. I hope that you're familiar with your general geography so that you know generally where, I, where, where I'm pointing at tonight. I also like to kind of get rid of the national boundaries, or at least the colors that are separating these countries, because it's important to keep in mind that all of these nation states and countries are also modern inventions. And so to the best of my ability, I like to wipe away all the modern names, all the, you know, the distinctions in geography in that way. And that just leaves us sort of with a general palette to use as a reference point. Next up is time. So I'm going to use this timeline. This is the timeline that I always use uh, when I give my presentations. It stretches from about 500 BC up to about 1000 AD. Here's the thing that I also always like to point out in my visual presentations. So it should never ever go unnoted that our, and by our, I mean English speaking. So if you can understand the words coming out of my face and you can speak English, then you're with the R. Our dating system is a very weird dating system. And I don't like this to ever go unnoticed. And what that is, is that we have this weird dating system where time is measured as stretching backwards and forwards from a magical date called the year zero, which doesn't exist. So I always like to point out that in terms of um, in terms of chronology, in terms of like timekeeping, the Christians won that battle, or at least they are the current winners of that battle where the default timekeeping system is the Christian timekeeping system. And when I'm giving a lecture about Buddhist history, that's always a little weird. And I, again, I don't like that to go unnoted, that we use a weird dating system that, that numerically moves out from this zero year. <laughs> so it kind of complicates things that way. But let us know, you know, let it be known, though, that we're talking about 
2,500 years ago from today back is when this story begins. So again, that's just for anybody who hasn't seen my other presentations and wants to know like, what's, what's with that weird, you know, timeline up there? Well, that's the idea. And so I start to use these little blocks to sort of designate the time periods that we're talking about. And I do this just to give everybody a frame of reference. If you aren't familiar with this uh, history, I just like everybody to know that Buddhism begins in kind of northeastern India, approximately 500 BC, in a place that at the time was called Magadha in modern day Bihar in India. This is where Siddhartha Gautama was born. These are his generally agreed upon dates. But again, there's a lot of debate about exactly when the Buddha was born. The Buddha, of course, was not the person's name. The Buddha is a title, meaning awakened one or enlightened one. But the person's uh, name, so to speak, Siddhartha Gautama. I like to give show you this only because of that particular gesture of the sword. So this is a cartoon, of course. This is just a cartoon image of Siddhartha making the great renunciation. And when Siddhartha made the great renunciation, he cuts off his, his long, uh, his hair that he had been growing since birth. So the story goes. And the reason why I wanted to show you this picture as it pertains to Manjushri is that at this point, this person, Siddhartha Gautama, is known as a bodhisattva. And so the cutting off of the hair, the great renunciation, sort of marks this journey towards awakening. And the journey towards awakening, that idea of someone headed for becoming a Buddha, that's called being a bodhisattva. And so Siddhartha is considered in that way, sort of the original bodhisattva. Now, we're going to complicate that a little bit tonight, but I just wanted to show you that association between bodhisattvahood and the sword cutting off attachments, cutting off delusion, cutting things off. It's just an interesting kind of relationship between Manjushri iconography and the history of Siddhartha. But again, that's not really why we're here. I'm here to tell you, you know, quickly about the spread of Buddhism. Again, this is for anybody who doesn't know this history. So as Buddhism sort of grows, and this is, of course, after the lifetime of the Buddha, you start to get sort of different kinds of Buddhism in India. And these two circles sort of represent, I would say, sort of a original Buddhism that we don't really have any access to. We don't really know exactly what was going on in the life of the Buddha. We have records, but of course we have records from different schools of Buddhism. So they all have different ideas of what the origins of Buddhism were. And so you kind of start to get two general trends in Buddhism. A conservative trend that's always hearkening back to some idea of an origin. And then a kind of what would be called a mainstream Buddhism that's sort of adapting and changing with culture and with time in that way. So as time moves forward, Buddhism begins to spread out of its point of origin from Magadha and begins to spread actually seemingly pretty quickly, starts to spread throughout what we call India. At this time, India was not a unified country. So it's very kind of inappropriate to refer to it as a single country. I'm going to make the mistake of calling it India, of course, but I want you to know that the Buddhism as it was spreading was spreading to different uh, 
kingdoms, different regions, different areas. And then as, again, as we move forward in time, things begin to get more complicated. And what you see here, where you have a kind of a darker yellow circle, and then I've put all of the subcontinent in one color. And those are basically meant to represent a kind of monastic core where there was the monks, the people, the monks and the nuns, by the way, but the monastics versus Buddhism as a kind of popular religious tradition that was growing in India, where people were becoming involved in Buddhism. Maybe they were supporting monks and nuns, Maybe they were devoted to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, so there was an element of faith. But in general, though, what I have, the, the, the lighter yellow that is covering all of India, that is meant to represent a group that is known as the Mahasangikas, the great Sangha. And the Mahasangikas were one form of Buddhism that included lay people and monastics in the great Sangha. And so they were called the Maha Sangha or the Maha Sangikas because they embraced both the laity and the monastics. Whereas there was the, again, that kind of more hardcore monastic type of Buddhism. And that more hardcore monastic type of Buddhism, as you can see, began to migrate to southern India. But then in the land of Magadha, in the, in the point of origin of Buddhism, basically more towards what today we call Nepal. Again, it was not called Nepal then. It was not an independent country then. But what we call Nepal, there was a type of Buddhism that began to grow called the Sarvastivadins. And the Sarvastivadins, that name means all exists. I'm not going to get into the specifics of what this school's uh, philosophy was. It has to do with that idea of all exists. But the Sarvastivadins were a very particular group. They seem to maybe have split off from the Mahasangikas at large, but you know, a, a real detailed history of the early Sarvastivadins has yet to be written, but they were active, again, more in Nepal, whereas that more hardcore group of monastics had then migrated all the way to the southern India. And they were, they were known as the Vibhajyavada, the divided teachings. And this is a group that will eventually become known as the Stahviravadins and then just eventually the Theravadins. And so this is a, a group, again, a group of hardcore monastics that migrated further south and will eventually go to Sri Lanka, that little island off the southern coast of India. There was also another group that was more active in the western part of India called the Pudgalavadins. And they were called that by other people. They didn't call themselves that, but they were called that by other people because they, they ascribed to something called the theory of the Pudgala, which was sort of like a, a provisional idea of a self that was in contrast to the, the strict doctrine of no self, of anatman, of, of really more dead dinosaurs to put inside of my 6.5 oh, V12. Thank Great for you. Okay. Oh, let me get my electricity. Oh. Hello. No, thanks. Dead sorry about, sorry about that, everybody. Ago. We're just trying to have a class you here. That's all. <laughs> so. The Pudgalavadins were this particular group that have this theory about a self, a provisional self, 
Meanwhile, the hardcore Theravadins were down in the south, and the Sarvastivadins were up there in the foothills of the Himalayas, up in Nepal. And then there was a yet another group of early Buddhists called the Mahashisakas. And the Maha and one particular faction of the Mahashisakas were called the Dharma Guptakas. And they were active in very, very northern India, basically what we today would call uh, Pakistan. So all of these groups, though, by the way, the Sarvastivadins, Pugalavadins, Dharmaguptakas, uh, Staviravadins, they were all part of what would be called the 18 schools. And my point here that I always like to let people know is that all of these groups were all what we would call today Hinayana. They were all part of the early archaic form of Buddhism. They were all monastic, by the way. They, they all were all, you know, it was about being a monk or a nun. It was just some, again, some included the lay as part of the Sangha. Some did not. But the reason why I like to walk everybody through this real quick is just to let everybody know that of these early schools, only one really survived intact to the modern time. And that was the group. I think I have it here. My next. Come on. Yeah, so that Staviravadin group goes to Sri Lanka, and that's the early Theravada. And they will eventually go to Southeast Asia, to Thailand and Burma. And that school, the Theravada or the Staviravadins or the Theravadins, they're the only one of those 18 schools to, to remain intact into the modern world. Now, because of that, they are very, their, their teachings, their language, which is the Pali language, it's all very important for understanding early Buddhism. But what I like everybody to know, though, is that they were only one of 18 schools. So don't, you know, forget that there were other options and they had other ideas and they were contemporaneous with the Theravadins in that sense. Meanwhile, a group like the Pudgalavadins, they disappear. We don't know really what happened to them. They seem to have just sort of faded out or gotten absorbed into other forms of Buddhism. The Sarvastivadin group basically takes over uh, dominance in Nepal, or again, what today we call Nepal. And then that leaves that Dharma Guptaka group, or the Mahashisakas, up in the north. Ah, sorry, in Nepal, Sarvastivadins, and then the Dharmaguptakas go over to Pakistan and Afghanistan. Again, what we call those things today. And as you can see from the timeline, we are now at that magical year zero. And my whole point of the presentation up to this point is to let you know that Buddhism up to this point, it all seemingly looks the same. It's very monastic, and it's kind of looks a lot like what the Theravadins look like today, but all of these groups looked like that in that sense, but they were just in different geographical regions. By the way, one of the things that distinguishes these different groups, by the way, even though they were all pretty much of the same general philosophy, same general practice, same general discipline. One of the things that distinguished them was that they, they wore different colored robes. The Theravadins, for example, wore saffron robes. The Sarvastivadins wore dark maroon, like very dark red maroon robes, the Dharmaguptakas wore black robes and the Mahashisakas wore blue robes. 
So I've actually separated these colors based upon the robes that these different groups would wear. This is actually going to be important <clears throat> a little bit later on if I get to it, but I just want you to know that modern Tibetan Buddhism is a continuation of the Sarvastivadins. And you know, or you probably know, that the Tibetans wear maroon robes, dark red maroon robes. And that comes from their Sarvastivadin heritage. Whereas in the Zen Buddhist tradition in Japan, for example, they wear black robes. And that's because the Zen tradition is actually goes back to the Dharma Gup, uh, the Dharma Guptikas that wore the black robes. So just want you to know that there's a lot of the history that done, uh, makes it to the modern world. Okay. But that brings us to where I really wanted to talk about today, which is a region called Gandhara. Oh, sorry. I thought I had it on there. But so Gandhara is in what we today would call Afghanistan, modern Pakistan, Afghanistan. And it was in Gandhara that the Dharma Guptikas became uh, kind of very uh, dominant. It was that was the type of Buddhism that was very popular there. And let's see if I have it here. Boop. Ah, yeah. So this is in Gandhara at this time. So I'm talking about the first and second century of the common era. There was an empire called the Kushan Empire, and that was in the Kush Valley, which is in the, the, that region of Pakistan, Afghanistan. And there was an emperor named Kanishka, Kanishka I, and he reigned from about 127 AD to 150 AD. The reason why Kanishka is so important to the history of Buddhism is because, oh, by the way, so this is Gandhara, the yellow circle I just put on the map. That was the Kushan Empire. So I really want you to know geographically where we're talking about, because this is sort of seemingly where Manjushri comes from. So <laughs> we've, we've made it to Manjushri. So, but first, this is a gold coin and there are a number of these gold coins that have been discovered, archaeological discoveries in Gandhara, in what was Gandhara. And this is an image of Kanishka, the first, the, the emperor, the great emperor of the Kushan Empire. And he's famous for having this, uh, like a kilt, like a triangular skirt um, big beard, all of that. But this is an image of Kanishka. But the most interesting thing about these Kanishka coins is what's on the other side. So on the back side of these Kanishka coins is this image. This is considered the oldest known image of a Buddha. And as you can see, there is Greek letters, Greek script on the side, and it says, Budo, Buddha. So that right there, what you're looking at is a standing image of a Buddha. He's making the gesture of fearlessness with his, uh, sorry, with his right hand. And he's holding uh, kind of a bunched up uh, part of his robe in his right hand like that. He's got the long earlobes. You can kind of see he's got big, long earlobes. He even has the kind of what's called the ushnisha, little protrudence. He's surrounded by a head halo and a body halo. And this is important for a number of reasons, but mainly it's really interesting to note where the oldest images of the Buddha come from where they are even, the fact that they're on a coin, on a gold coin, nonetheless. So Kanishka obviously was into the Buddha. <laughs> Let me put it to you that way. He was so into the Buddha that he put the Buddha on the flip side of his coins. So Gandhara was a major epicenter of Buddhist activity 
in the ancient world, all right? I cannot like really stress enough how significant Gandhara is to the history of Buddhism because it's from Gandhara that Buddhism is going to spread to China all over. So let's get back to the map. So what I want to tell you about now is that it is from Gandhara that Buddhism then spread uh, east to China. And this all happened during the first century of the common era. And the Chinese got mostly Dharma Guptaka Buddhism from Gandhara, but they also got a smattering of Sarvastivadin Buddhism, and they also got a smattering of Hinayana, like monastic Hinayana. I wouldn't say that it was Theravada because the Theravadins were all the way down in Sri Lanka. So there was still a kind of very monastic type of Buddhism that did make it into China. So it was sort of these three general trends that made its way into China, all from Gandhara, all coming out of the Central Asia in that way. This was happening during what is known as the Han Dynasty. And, you know, just for history buffs, of course, China is a modern word. It would be much more accurate to say that Buddhism went to the Han, like went to the Han Dynasty, not to China, because again, there was no such country as China. But what we know of as, as the Chinese now got Buddhism during that first century of the Common Era. And it was during the Han Dynasty that this Buddhist monk came to China. So his name was Loka Kashema. Those are not his dates. Those are just the specific dates that we know he was alive. <laughs> we know that Loka Kashema came to China in around 147 AD and was there until about 189 AD. And he was from Gandhara. So Loka Kashema, a Gandharan monk, traveled to China. And when he was there, he translated some of the first Buddhist sutras into Chinese. So this is Loka Kashema. He was originally, he was Kushan, right? He's from the Kush Valley. And he translated nine sutras into Chinese. Manju Shri appears in six of them. And these that I have listed here, and I'm going to walk you through them really quickly. These are the oldest known references to Manju Shri. And so a quick, like just a quick um, way of thinking about history. If a Buddhist monk <laughs> traveled to China and translated these sutras into Chinese in the year 147, they were probably not written in the year 146, <laughs> is, is, is what I mean. Like these things don't happen overnight. And so these six sutras that, again, I want to walk you through their contents just briefly, but these are probably, you know, probably from the first century, maybe even from BC, right? Before the common era, as it's called. We can't really know for sure, but what we can know for sure is that a monk named Loka Kashema showed up in China and translated these into Chinese. And, you know, I... I'm a historian, and so I understand more than understanding history, it's important to understand chronology. And so it's pretty well understood that this happened, like historically speaking. And so I just want you to notice that 
this was a long time ago. <laughs> Meaning Manjushri is clearly a very old part of the Buddhist tradition. This, this character didn't just pop up yesterday is what I'm getting at. So again, Loka Kashema translated nine sutras into Chinese. One of them, probably one of the more famous is the Ashtahasarika Pranyaparamita Sutra, which is the 8,000 line Pranyaparamita Sutra. By the way, if you want to know, there is an English translation of this by Edward Konza. Uh, in fact, I think there's even another one that's been done since him. But this uh, sutra is translated into English. It's one of the earliest Pranyaparamita sutras, and Manjushri figures very highly in it as, in, as the voice of wisdom, the voice of pranya. So that idea of pranya, of transcendent wisdom, in this sutra, Manjushri basically is one of the main speakers. There's also this sutra called the Frost Sutra, Tushara Sutra. I do not think there is an English translation of this. Manjushri kind of only appears in this one very briefly. He's not really a main character. Same with the next one, the questions of Druma, the Kinara King uh, the Ajata Shatru Kalkritya Vinodana Sutra, also not translated into English to my knowledge. Manjushri, also kind of a minor character, but he is present. Then there's this one that actually has Manjushri in the title. Manjushri asks about the rank of Bodhisattva. This is also, I don't think this is translated into English, but it's a Important sutra, though, because Manjushri asks the Buddha about being a bodhisattva. Like, what does it mean to be a bodhisattva? And so that's an important sutra for introducing this Mahayana Buddhist idea of people becoming Buddhas. Like, not just following what the Buddha said and being a good monk or a good nun, but actually treading this bodhisattva path just like the Buddha did and becoming a Buddha themselves. So that seems to be an important sutra for introducing this very, very important idea in Mahayana Buddhism. But what I really want to tell you about is the very last one on this list, the Loka Nuvartana Sutra. There is a partial English translation of this one, I believe. And I think even Paul Harrison himself has translated uh, a partial version of this that was discovered in Sanskrit. But what I want to tell you about this one, though, this is a really interesting sutra because in it, in this version called the, the version that's called the, the Loka Nuvartana Sutra, Manjushri appears in there. And that sutra is about, oh, I have it there. So it comes from a, like a world of sutras in which the Buddha is not considered human exactly. Meaning that the Buddha in these sutras is specifically the one, the, the Loka Nuvartana Sutra. The Buddha is a supernatural being, is not described as Siddhartha Gautama, the prince who he is, he is described that way as the prince that renounced the throne and became the Buddha. But in that sutra, the Buddha is considered to be a supernatural being who pretended to be born in Magadha, who pretended to leave the throne, who just sort of put on this uh, performance for everybody. So 
it's in a sutra like that that you really start to see the you know super mahayana kind of ideas of the buddha but what's interesting about it is that in that sutra there's this question about other people becoming buddhas like transcending their humanness or humanity in that sense and in that sutra there's this kind of question about well is like can anybody actually do this and it is said that yeah manjushri is doing it like manjushri is someone who is on the bodhisattva path headed towards buddhahood so that's an interesting part of this sutra but there's another interesting part there are some lines in this sutra that manjushri says and according to paul harrison's article that i mentioned at the beginning of this talk there is a hinayana an early buddhist text called the mahavastu and in that, the Hinayana version, there is someone named the Venerable Vagisa, who seems to just be a monk named Vagisa, the Venerable Vagisa. And in the Mahavastu, the early Hinayana version of this text, it is this monk, the Venerable Vagisa, that says the same things as Manjushri in this Loka Nuvartana Sutra. And so Paul Harrison makes a, 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 a very quick speculation in his uh, article that could this monk, the Venerable Vagisa, be Manjushri? In other words, he speculates that Manjushri may have been a, a real person. But he actually, in that article, he presents three possibilities for the origins of bodhisattvas. So if you remember, that article was called Manjushri and the Cult of the Celestial Bodhisattvas. And it's a really good article, by the way, because what he's challenging is a lot of commonly accepted notions about bodhisattvas. One of those commonly accepted understandings of bodhisattvas is that they are purely fictitious, like um, purely fictitious characters that they're, they're entirely sort of these angelic imaginations. He challenges that idea. And he basically says that there is no basis for making such a claim, even though many, many, many scholars all throughout the 20th century made that claim that Avilokiteshvara, Manjushri, all of these bodhisattvas were not real people. They were just fictitious. Well, based upon this interesting moment or, or uh, this interesting overlap between these two texts, Paul Harrison suggests three possibilities for the origins of bodhisattvas, in particular bodhisattvas like Manjushri. He says, one, they might have been actual people that became known as bodhisattvas, became known by different names, like the gentle glorious one, but that might, they might may have been original people. He also though makes the suggestion that it might be that the Mahayana sort of chooses these kind of, um, yeah, you know, lesser known figures, lesser known characters from kind of obscure sutras or obscure texts. And yeah, they're, they were once a actual person, but then the Mahayana comes and takes them and turns them into something more. 
And then his third option for the origin of bodhisattvas is that they are just completely made up fictitious kind of sci-fi characters in that way. So, you, you know, there's a lot of, nobody knows, this is all pretty ancient history at this point. But what we do know though, is that a Manjushri, this bodhisattva, this character was very, very important in these very early Mahayana Buddhist sutras. So, all right, so I know I've been going on for a while. Any questions or comments or ideas? Everybody doing okay with this? Yeah. Hey, Michael, um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, what if these, these sutras that were translated um, from to Chinese by Lokakshima, from mm -hmm. what language were they translated and do the, do, could we, can I assume that the, those original texts don't exist? Otherwise they would be the original uh, location of, uh, of where the Manjushri's name came up. Is that right? I, I didn't get that last part. Oh, and if if they if they do they exist in the original language, because otherwise ah. or do they not? Yep. Um, that's gonna vary. So the first answer to your first question is is that the original language of these sutras, the quick answer is that it was Sanskrit. The more accurate answer to that, though, is that they were all translated from a language that we call Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. So there is an actual sub-language of Sanskrit that is called Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit, and it's its own language. And it's its own language because it is kind of like Sanskrit, but it uses a particular grammar that is a little bit more like Pali. And it uses a lot of words that are Sanskrit words, but it uses them in a very unique way. And it's very actually interesting and important to know that First, I mention this a lot, but if you, if everybody in the audience, everybody watching, you know, if you're familiar with this other language, the Pali language that I mentioned is the language of the Theravadins, the Pali language, by the way, is a Buddhist language. There is not, there isn't anything in Pali except Buddhist texts. It is what would be called an ecumenical language. It's, it's exclusively a Buddhist language for Buddhism. The Buddha seems to have created a lot of new words and have used language in a new way. So Pali is a Buddhist language. And then when Buddhism was being sort of adopted by the mainstream Indian culture and becoming Sanskritized, they created yet another new language exclusively for Buddhism. And again, modern scholars call this Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. So these texts that we're looking at, the six here are actually all nine of Loka Kashema's translations were from Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit let's just call it Sanskrit. The 8,000 line Pranyaparamita Sutra does exist in Sanskrit. We have actually, I think, multiple Sanskrit versions of that, multiple early Chinese versions that were from Sanskrit. So that one's well attested to. The rest of those, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, Gnome, if, they, if there are Sanskrit surviving ones. Like I said, I know that the I think it's the Ajata Shatru Kakritya Vinodana Sutra that is partially, we have a partial Sanskrit one. So, but yeah, they were all being translated from Sanskrit in that way. So, yeah. Okay. Cool. So let's move on. 
I wanted to tell you about some other early uh, translations into Chinese from the Mahayana tradition. One sutra that's really, really important to the history of Manjushri is the Shurangama Samadhi Sutra, the Heroic Samadhi or Heroic Concentration Sutra. So the earliest version of this that we have is a translation from Kumara Jiva, and he did that in the 400s, in the early 400s. But there is a record of this sutra from 186, also very old. Now, again, we do that translation doesn't survive, but we know that there was a translation of this sutra made at that time. By the way, if you're interested in this sutra, there is an English translation by Etienne Lamotte the famous French uh, Buddhist scholar. I'm going to probably teach this sutra sometime. I don't know if I'll do a Dharma doors or I'll do my own class on it, but this is a really, really powerful sutra. Um, the reason why I want to tell you about it is because there is a particular samadhi, a particular meditative concentration that this sutra describes. And what's interesting about it is that it's very associated with Manjushri because in a lot of ways, insofar as Manjushri is alive and well in the world today, <laughs> Manjushri is understood to be in the Shurangama Samadhi. And it's what allows him to appear <laughs> in all of these different places, like the Dharma doors on Sunday nights, <laughs> for example. So it's a pretty kind of like mystical sutra in that way. And it, just to share with you just a little, little tidbit, what's so fun about this sutra is that basically the Buddha, he, the Buddha tricks Mara so Mara is like the devil, right? Mara. The Buddha tricks Mara into making the Bodhisattva vow and begin to eventually become a Buddha. And so it's just a really kind of delightful sutra in that way. Um, it, it kind of, I guess, is dealing with the problem of evil in that sense. But anyways, it's a great sutra. Wanted to tell you about that. Um, Manjushri is probably most well known for his appearance in the Vimalakirti Nirdesha Sutra. So, every, you know, I've taught the Vimalakirti Sutra at the, at the Dharma Collective. Um, it, the Vimalakirti Sutra is sort of one of the more famous Mahayana Sutras. By the way, there is a new translation of the Vimalakirti Sutra by... Luis Gomez and Paul Harrison, this uh, scholar of Buddhism I'm talking about tonight, or that I'm kind of getting a lot of ideas from. Um, this is from Sanskrit. So that makes this a very interesting new translation, because I believe up to this point, we have translations either from Chinese or Tibetan, but this is from a Sanskrit version. So if you're really into the Vimalakirti Sutra, you should probably pick that up. Um, obviously, Manjushri is a major character in the Vimalakirti Sutra. In fact, the Vimalakirti Sutra is sort of a back and forth between Manjushri and Vimalakirti, the star of that sutra. And then also famously, uh, Manjushri is a very important character in the Sadharma Pundarika Sutra, otherwise known as the Lotus Sutra. And in the Lotus Sutra, Manjushri is sort of our, Manjushri is like our, who is it in, in the Inferno? Is it Virgil? Is it Virgil that leads uh, the guy down into hell? Either way, Manjushri is sort of our guide through the Lotus Sutra. 
Manjushri is the bodhisattva that sort of tells us the reader like what's going on and and sort of guides us through the sutra notice that the lotus sutra was translated into chinese around 286 so it's kind of a little bit later than we've been talking about but still a very early sutra all right ah and then one more very important Mahayana Buddha Sutra, in which Manjushri appears, is the gigantic Bhutavatamsaka Sutra, otherwise just known as the Avatamsaka Sutra. So this is that monster sutra, kind of like one of the biggest sutras around. And although that sutra is full of bodhisattvas, Manjushri does figure very highly in it. He sort of has multiple chapters dedicated to just him, or at least he's the main person talking. And one of the chapters, chapter seven, which is the chapter on all these different names of the Buddha, that sutra kind of circulated all by itself. And then eventually, a bunch of little sutras got compiled into this big old major sutra. The one thing that I want to mention about Manjushri's appearance in the Avatamsaka Sutra, Manjushri in the Avatamsaka Sutra, he isn't from this world. So in the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Buddha puts out, emits a light that sort of illuminates the entire universe. And after he emits this light that illuminates the universe, bodhisattvas start arriving from all 10 directions. And in the Avatamsaka Sutra, Manjushri comes from the east. He comes from a different Buddha land where there's a different Buddha. And the reason why I want to mention this is that you might recall, although it's been a while, that in the sutra that we've been reading, there was also this kind of calling of bodhisattvas from all these different directions and all these bodhisattvas arriving from the 10 directions. And that starts to become a kind of a theme, a theme related to Manjushri. Uh, yeah, I'll just put it simply that it's this idea that Manjushri isn't from this world, and that he's actually from a world to the east. And I mention this because it's around this time, around the time of the Avatamsaka Sutra growing in popularity in Central Asia and coming to China. It's around this time that you start to get what Paul Harrison calls, right, the cult of these celestial bodhisattvas. And so in the Avatamsaka Sutra and other sutras where, where bodhisattvas are coming from these other worlds and coming from different directions, this starts to, or it turns into a form of, well, there's a lot of different ways to call it, but basically I'll just put, say it, it, it's a kind of Manjushri worship, right? They would call it a, a cult. It's kind of kind of weird language, but it's this idea of these little like sub subversions of Buddhism, where it's like, yeah, yeah, we we're 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 devoted to the Buddha, we're devoted to Buddhism, but we're gonna kind of have this special relationship with just this one bodhisattva. Like, I'm going to be just really into Manjushri. And all of a sudden, when you start to get this cultic activity where people are now kind of doing rituals 
dedicated to just one bodhisattva, all of a sudden, the direction from which these bodhisattvas come is very important because, well, a lot like the way Muslims face Mecca when they pray, so they face towards uh, Medina or towards Mecca, in the same way, someone devoted to Manjushri would start sort of maybe facing east or having an image of Manjushri on the eastern wall of their uh, sanctuary, if you will. So all of a sudden, sort of, you start to get these, and it, this happens in the Avatamsaka Sutra, you start to get the, the background story of these bodhisattvas, like where they're from, what direction they're from, what their the Buddha is called, what the land, like they're they're from a particular world and what that's called. And I just want you to know that all of that kind of information comes much later, after Manjushri has already been a well-established character in those earlier sutras that I mentioned. So I would actually love to tell you a lot more about Manjushri in the Avatamsaka Sutra, but we have one more stop to go tonight that I want to make sure to get to. Everybody doing okay, though, by the way? Maybe. Cool. All right. So that brings us to our Maharatnakuta Sutra. So this is the collection that we've been reading. It's the collection I've been reading from at the for Dharma Doors for a long time now. As I've mentioned, this is a collection of 49 sutras. And Manjushri appears in many of them. So he is a major figure in those. So he he appears, I guess, if you count those up, he appears in eight plus four plus three. So I guess not a lot of the, the Ratnakuta collection, but they're major sutras. And three of those sutras are Manju Shri sutras. The first I'll tell you about is the 10th of the collection. This is the Manju Shri Samantamukha Sutra, the universal gateway of Manju Shri. So I actually have taught this sutra at the San Francisco Dharma Collective. There is somewhere, oh no, this is way before YouTube days, but on my SoundCloud, there is an audio recording of a few, I think I did it over a few nights, but there's an audio recording of the Manjushri Samanta Mukta Sutra. Um, and so... That was the first sutra that I taught that was about Manjushri. And that's a really powerful sutra. I really kind of, if, you're, if you've been into the sutra we've been working on, I would really encourage you to go back and listen to that uh, talk I gave on that sutra. The one thing I want to mention about the Samanta Mukha, this universal gateway there there are a few other samanta mukas there's a few other bodhisattva universal gateways and actually if i'm losing all my books now but well i won't be able to find it but in the lotus sutra Chapter, I want to say it's chapter 25 of the Lotus Sutra, but I can't remember right off the top of my head. But one of the chapters of the Lotus Sutra is Avilokiteshvara, Bodhisattva's universal gateway. And so there's this, again, it's kind of a subgenre of sutras where they are dedicated exclusively to a Bodhisattva. And it's exclusively about kind of gaining entry to enlightenment through that bodhisattva. 
So in the Lotus Sutra, you can read about the universal gateway of Avilokiteshvara. And in the Maharatnakuta, you can read about Manjushri's universal gateway. Sutra number 15 of the collection is the one that we've been reading uh, this year. So this is the Manjushri Vyakaranya Sutra, the prediction of Manjushri's enlightenment. So we are in the, in the process of finishing that sutra. And then the third major sutra dedicated to Manjushri is Manjushri's Pranyaparamita Sutra. So I've also done a Dharma talk, uh, a multi-night Dharma talk on this Manjushri Sutra. This is on YouTube. This was one of the earlier uh, uh, YouTube videos uh, that we did when we started recording these. So I think I spent about maybe seven or eight nights, I forget exactly, on that sutra. And that one is very important because it is it's like, insofar as Manjushri is the bodhisattva of pranya wisdom, that sutra is Manjushri's Pranya Paramita Sutra. I believe it is called, or not called, but it, I believe it is the Pranya Paramita Sutra in 700 lines. So if you know the Pranya, the Pranya Paramita Sutras are all divided into how long they are. You, you might remember there was the 8,000 line version of the Pranyaparamita Sutra. So Manjushri has his own version of the Pranyaparamita Sutra that appears in the Ratnakuta collection. Very, very important sutra as well. And then he appears in another eight of those sutras where he is a major kind of question and answer um, or interlocutor, asker of questions. And then there's just four sutras where <clears throat> his name is given. So he's, he's there, but he doesn't really say anything and he doesn't really do anything. So, all right. So everybody feeling okay? Any questions, comments, answers, ideas so far? All right, so then I'll just tell you about a couple of more things. So you might notice that if you if you're looking at the screen, so the the Maharatnakuta collection is actually not from Gandhara. It's not from Central Asia, like a lot of the other Manjushri sutras we've been talking about, or like a lot of the other Mahayana sutras we've been talking about. What's interesting about the uh, Ratnakuta is that it's actually from Andhra Pradesh. It's actually from southern India or much further south than we're talking about when we're talking about Afghanistan and Pakistan. And the reason why this is important or the reason why I really want to note this is there's a kind of a misconception perhaps or just a misunderstanding that Mahayana Buddhism is exclusively a Northern Indian and Afghani and Pakistani type of Buddhism. And that the misunderstanding is that Southern India was strictly kind of Theravada or strictly kind of the more monastic conservative type of Buddhism. And that's not, not true at all. So I just want to make it clear that Mahayana Buddhism was popular all throughout India, all throughout Central Asia, and then of course became the dominant form of Buddhism in China, Japan, Mongolia, Korea, and so on. But this collection that we've been reading from, the Maharatnakuta collection, it's well, it's tricky because it's a collection of sutras. And we know that some of those sutras are very old, whereas some of them were relatively new. And you'll notice that the entire collection was brought to China in the eighth century. So in the 700s, 
by a monk named Boriruchi. So one of the, so basically what I'm getting at is that the sutra that we're reading, the prediction of Manjushri's enlightenment, that sutra, that's a pretty like old, I mean, new sutra, old, new, <laughs> all of this starts to get confusing, but it's much later than the 8,000 line Praniparamita Sutra, which was one of the earliest ones we talked about. And so as I've been kind of pointing out, as we've been reading this, this sutra, the Manjushri's Enlightenment Sutra, it's very aware of other like Mahayana sutras, and it's obviously very aware of the so-called Hinayana, which is to say the earliest of the sutras. So I kind of just have like a big part of tonight has been, I wanted to give everybody a sense of the time that we're talking about here. Like I wanted everybody to have a sense of exactly how old these Manjushri sutras are, but also sort of the chronology of their um, growth and change. And so, in other words, if you if you know if I had hours and hours and hours of your time tonight, we could really go through and and notice how in the earliest of these sutras, Manjushri is just a name and says, says things like, you know, says wise things about Pranya. But in the early of those, the earlier versions of these sutras, we don't hear about where he's from. We don't hear about how he looks. We don't hear about all these other things. But over time, you start to get these additions to the story. Eventually, we find out what direction he's from, what planet he's from, or what, what other world he's from, until you eventually get to the sutra that we've been reading, where we get the entire backstory of Manjushri. Because if you remember, the, the kind of the, the centerpiece, so to speak, of this sutra was the prediction of Manjushri's enlightenment. And, it, and I know it's been a while, but we learned all about how there was like this, like way long, long time ago, kalpas and kalpas and kalpas ago, we learned how there was a king, right? A king named, you know, ubiquitous space. And that that, that king eventually makes this bodhisattva uh, vow, generates bodhicitta, and that that king eventually becomes Manjushri and all of that. So we kind of just get the whole backstory. And it always reminds me of like, uh, I, I don't know if you if you read comic books as a kid or if you still read them, but it reminds me a lot of what happens with comic books where you'll get a character who will appear in a comic and then they're very popular. And so then they get their own comic. And then as time goes on, you eventually get the backstory of where they came from. And you even get like the future story of like where their life leads and all of that. And so there's a lot of kind of interesting overlap in terms of, in terms of storytelling and narration in that way. So. All right. Um, ah, by the way, the sorry about this. I just put this talk together recently. So that blue dot is where the Maharatna Kuta collection is supposedly from, Andhra Pradesh. So you can see that it's quite, you know, southeastern India there. A couple of more things really quickly before we go. Eventually, though. As, as we move into the 8th century, 9th century, 10th century, 
Manjushri continues to grow in popularity. And there are a couple of other texts, but I just want to tell you about well, I will, actually, I don't even, well, I'll, I'll show you because I, I want to show you this book. So there's a book here. And actually, what I'll do, let's see, let me, do 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 do. Oh, no, come on. Sorry, folks, I just want to get back to you there. Okay. So just share with you this book really quick. It's called Mediating the Power of the Buddhas. And it's about a text called the Manjushri Mulakalpa. So the Manjushri Mulakalpa is a very important tantra. So it is not a sutra, it's a tantra. And this Manjushri Mulakalpa Tantra is, well, if you don't know, let me tell you about a Tantra. So you may have heard this term Tantric Buddhism, and you might have heard about Tantrism. So a Tantra is a text. It's a, it's a type of text. It's kind of a complement to sutras. But what a tantra is, is a ritual manual. A tantra describes how to do particular rituals. <clears throat> and so tantric Buddhism is a type of Buddhism that is based upon tantras. It, they use sutras too, of course, but in addition to sutras, they use these other texts called tantras. And again, these tantras are ritual manuals. The Manjushri Mulakalpa is one of the most important tantras, and it's an entire ritual manual dedicated to Manjushri. And so, and it's used in the Tibetan tradition, by the way. So I kind of just wanted to round out this evening by kind of showing you the arc, the arc of Manjushri. It, it has a lot to do with, um, oh, it has a lot to do with a lot, but the basic idea is, is that even it's, it has even happened a little bit in the sutra that we're reading, and you can kind of even see the, the beginnings of this in the sutra that we're reading. Manjushri Bodhisattva, although he starts off as like, this kind of um, a questioner of the Buddha. So the Buddha is the Buddha. <laughs> and then there's the Bodhisattva who's asking the Buddha questions. But as time goes on in these sutras, Manjushri keeps elevating until at a certain point, Manjushri is on par with the Buddha. Like, is is just as equally as wise, just as equally enlightened, just as equally everything. And then this thing happens where actually Manjushri like becomes greater than the Buddha. And they even kind of start to do this thing where in certain sutras, and certain tantras, by the way, they start to do this thing where it's kind of like, oh yeah, you remember the Buddha? Like Siddhartha and that whole thing? That was just Manjushri in disguise. <laughs> it's like, wait, what? And at that point, Manj it's just Manjushri. And Manjushri is just appearing in different forms. And so my point is, is that a ritual manual like this that's dedicated to Manjushri, he, Manjushri just reaches this point to where it's not even about, um, well, my point is it just, you could almost call it Manjushriism, if you will. <laughs> 
meaning it's like it's whole it's a whole almost sub religion unto itself and that's kind of the way that a lot of tantric uh traditions or a lot of tantric buddhist traditions work is that whoever it is that you are are ritualizing whoever it is that you're devoted to or dedicated to they're the top of the pile and everybody else this by the way this happens with avilokiteshvara as well eventually we learn oh yeah actually the buddha was just avilokiteshvara in disguise and avilokiteshvara is the great uh, buddha of compassion or the great bodhisattva of compassion and out of compassion for the world Avilokiteshvara appeared as Siddhartha and left the throne and, be, and seemed to become enlightened. But it was all an act of compassion for everyone. So just wanted you to know that at a certain point, and that it all kind of culminates in this particular Manjushri Mulakalpa, where Manjushri becomes basically bigger than the Buddha. So... Oh, and while I have it here too, if that is all very interesting to you, one of the best little books on Manjushri is this one called Studies on the Mysteries of Manjushri. And it's all about these uh, Manjushri mandalas that are used as part of a tantric ritual tradition. So, all right. So that's going to conclude our presentation on the literature of Manju Shri. May have any questions, comments, answers, ideas. Cool. All right. Um, so we still have a few paragraphs to go in our sutra, so we're not done yet. So stay tuned next week to where we will continue uh, and, and perhaps finish the sutra who knows so. <laughs>